Hello, everyone, and welcome to another debrief episode of Channel 781 News. Uh, my name is Chris Campbell. This is, well, we're going to talk uh, about the election season. We're going to talk about um, who's pulled papers, a little bit about um, how we feel about uh, the race right now, and also the election calendar itself. Um, then we're going to give updates on three of the things we've been talking about in the past, um, which is the single family zoning ordinance, the tenants' rights ordinance, and the uh, Municipal Housing Trust Fund that we brought up in our last debrief. There's a little update on that. Um, this week, I'm uh, joined uh, by the consistent Josh Castor. Hello, everyone. And James Kelly. What room? And yeah, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the election season. Um, it uh, Everyone is able now to pull papers. Um, and I have a little bit of a tradition. Um, this is the third time I've done this in six years, uh, where every the first day uh, that people pull papers, I um, I sit in front of the clerk's office for like five hours and then just like watch people pull papers uh, because I find this stuff interesting. Um, and then this year with Channel 71 News, I like went a little further and everyone uh, that I could while I was there, I asked um, what drove them to pull papers and uh, I recorded their voice and then I converted that to text and then I put it um, online on Facebook and Twitter. Um, you can find the responses there. A few people did. Um, so that was pretty fun. Uh, and so we're going to share um, right now on the screen uh, who has pulled papers. Okay, pulled up. Um, and so in the mayoral race, you have Jeanette McCarthy and Jonathan Paz. And um, first time candidate that we don't know is uh, Dwayne Champagne um, pulled papers as well uh, for at large. Uh, you have incumbents Colleen Bradley MacArthur, Kathleen McMiniman, Carlos Vidal, Randy LeBlanc, Tom Stanley, Patrick O'Brien. Um, you have first time candidates Emily Superior, Emma Zumas, uh, Susan G. Rockefeller, R Rosenfelder, sorry, um, and Timothy, Timothy King. Um, in the Ward 1 seat, uh, Anthony has pulled papers, uh, the incumbent, and no one challenging him. Ward 2, no one's pulled papers yet, although. Anticipate Karen Dunn to do so. Actually, what am I talking about? Karen Dunn for papers today. Um, in Ward Three, William Hanley, uh, Bill Hanley is uh, pulled in Ward Three. Um, Council Ward Four, the incumbent John Laughlin has pulled papers. Council in Ward Five, the incumbent Joel Cava has pulled papers. In Ward Six, the incumbent John Dirk has pulled papers. In Ward Seven, um, Paul Gates, the incumbent has pulled papers, and also first-time candidate Robert Davis has pulled papers. Um, in Ward 8, Kathy and Harris, the incumbent has pulled papers. In Ward 9, in Jonathan, absent, in Jonathan Paz's absent seat, you have Robert Logan, who held the seat for like 30 years. He lost to Paz four years ago, um, pulled papers, um, and also our friend Eamon Dawes. Um, for school committee, the only person that has pulled papers is Margaret Donnelly. Um, and so that is the playing field right now for the mayoral. The interesting thing is that uh, there's a third candidate during Champaign. Um, I, I think uh, I actually had a conversation with Dwayne over the phone um, because I wasn't sure if he was real or not. Um, and he seems like every single person I've ever run into in Waltham on the street ever. Um, he's got a very Waltham background, very Waltham values. I think if you're a long time resident of Waltham, you're going to enjoy what he has to say. I'd be interested to see if he, pull, he gets 50 signatures, does not seem very politically uh, connected at all. Um, and uh, I um, think he's doing Paz a favor. I thought Paz was gonna get someone to pull papers to run to trigger a preliminary anyway. Um, there has been a little bit of talk that someone's gonna do a poll, which is interesting. I don't know if that's actually true or not because like gossip gets spread around here very easily. Um, but I assume that no one is gonna pull uh, do a poll uh, because they're so expensive. Um, and there will be no polling. And then a, having a preliminary in September before the November election really helps the um, the non-incumbent candidate uh, get a sense of where they are and what they need to accomplish. And so if Dwayne uh, gets those 50 signatures, um, that is going to help Jonathan Paz, I believe. That is what I think, um, because he'll be able to have a sense of where he's at. Um, at large, uh, I'm very excited about Emma Zumas, uh, who the show is not familiar with, but I would like to give a glowing endorsement of. Um, actually, is a friend of our show, uh, has been listening probably as long as uh, we've been doing this, Re has reached out to us on a couple of different matters, but has gotten really involved in critical mass. She's a public health professional, 
just has really good ideas about the city. Um, just a really uh, personable person. I think she's going to do really well in the doors. I think she's uh, got great ideas. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, and of course, Emily Superior, um, who, if you watch the show, you will know, um, running at large. Really excited about that. Uh, we knew that Timothy King was going to run. We've talked about him before. He's a retired police officer. Um, so we knew he was going to run. The only person on the at-large list that I don't know anything about is Susan Rosenfelder. Bill Hanley running in Ward 3. Um, if I have the time and effort, I'm going to go back and, and show where I said that Bill Hanley was definitely going to run based on his mannerisms around the city um, a few months ago. Um, even though he never publicly declared until he pulled papers, I would just like to say that I was right that Bill Hanley is running in Ward Three, and I even said he could run in at, at large, but I think he's going to run in Ward Three. And he's in ward three. Um, we do know that Paul Tracy um, plans to run in Ward Three, um, and we and I mean George has said he's going to run again, and so there will be a preliminary there. Um, and I will have more about to say about Paul Tracy later, but I want to collect my words a little bit uh, for that one. Um, everybody else uh, does not have a challenger except for uh, Paul Cates, uh, Robert Davis, um, who I know absolutely nothing about from um, public information. Uh, I mean, he's put he put his address um, uh, on uh, a piece of paper, and he lives next to Nipomar, which is right next to where I live. Um, but besides that, I know absolutely nothing about him. Uh, looking forward to hearing more. I'm glad that the Ward 7 counselor has a opponent. Um, and then and then in Ward 9, so, I mean, it's going to be a very interesting race. Uh, Eamon Doss, uh, new, uh, young, um, will undoubtedly get an endorsement from Jonathan Paz versus Robert Logan, who, uh, who represented the Ward for 30 years and also, um, you know, didn't lose by that much. Um, and so he's almost an incumbent. He's not an incumbent, and so he just he does not get all of the advantages of an incumbent. But like he's very close to an incumbent. Um, and so yeah, nothing with school committee. I know no one interesting that's going to pull for school committee. I certainly hope if you're listening to this and you're thinking about school committee that you pull papers to run for school committee. Um, there was talk that Renee Arena was going to pull papers again, but she has not as of yet. Um, and. Those are my takes right now. Does anyone want to butt in before I continue talking about election stuff? I just wanted to say I went to Emily's kickoff event. She already has her signatures. She got them really quick, which is impressive. And she had a really good turnout at the event, given that she, you know, we just found out last week she was running. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited about that. I'm very excited about her running. And I'm excited about Eamon running too. The one thing I'm worried about is we need more challengers in the ward seats. I, we can't have all these people run unopposed because then there's just, even if the newcomers win, we can't change that much. So we need more, if you're thinking about running for in your ward, please do. And school committee, we really need more people. It could be the other two incumbents are planning on polling papers, they probably mm -hmm. are. But in case they're not, we can't take the chance that a Renee Arena or someone like that is gonna get in just because there's not enough candidates. So if you've thought about running for school committee, please, Think about it more, get in touch with us if there's anything we can do to, to help with the information you need. I also would like to take the opportunity to point out that having this like a ward counselor is, is nice for having like access for if you're a homeowner to directly to the city council. But you can kind of see in this just how little turnover there tends to be in ward counselor seats because and, and also, how little representation for renters there then would tend to be in these types of ward councilor seats because you have to live in that ward and they're kind of the borders can be kind of arbitrarily drawn and redrawn. And you, you may find yourself having to move because you can't afford the rent and suddenly I, that's a much less like secure sort of position for you to be in as like a you'd have to then be running in a different ward maybe things like that and it's just a much more volatile situation as a renter to be subjecting yourself to the obvious outcome is there's more homeowners represented who are going to be acting on things that benefit homeowners and i think the only real like solution in this is getting some of these people out I and mean, it's going to require more people running yeah if you um if you are thinking about running at all 
definitely reach out to us. We would love to chat. I've already had a couple of conversations with people this year about running. Um, but also, if you are listening to this and you're not, you're, I'm going to make this plug again. If you're excited about Jonathan Paz uh, running for mayor, if you're excited about any of these new people running at large, if you're excited about Eamon Dawes running at Ward 9, if you do not help these people, you they will lose. They will not win unless you, the person hearing this, helps their campaign. They will lose because they're, they are progressive, not incumbents. They are going to lose unless people like you help them because it requires a lot of work and a lot of effort. Um, this, this whole election season kind of reminds me of 2017, um, which saw a lot of like non-incumbents um, uh, pulling papers. And so, you know, I'm very excited about the idea of my friends uh, pulling papers and doing this. And just for the record, you know, just to make it seem like, you know, you know, this show is like super insider. I didn't know most of these people were running. It's like, I was as surprised as anyone uh, when Eamon uh, pulled papers. I was, you know, I just want to say like, we show up to this show and we just talk. Like we have very little insider information about any of this stuff. Um, but, um, and so I just don't want a repeat of what 2007, the, you know, the bad parts about 2017, because there were definitely some good parts. But the bad part uh, was that people, some people got really burnt out um, and were really disappointed. And, and so, you know, I wish that I had run two years later because I would love to run with these people. These are great people. Um, but I just don't, I just don't want people to get discouraged if things don't work out. I don't want the people that have been getting super into the community in the past couple of years uh, to get invested in this kind of stuff and into winning these kinds of races. And then, you know, it doesn't work out. Uh, and then you become disinterested in engaging with the community because I've seen that happen to so many people. And I would really like to continue the really good momentum that I've been seeing. And so I really don't want people to get so invested in a win in electoral politics. There are many other ways to win in the city as well. And so if you are listening to this and you want these people to win, please get involved and please help them. And, uh, and we will continue um, updating this list as well. Uh, but if you were interested in keeping touch uh, during the week, we'll be updating our two threads on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and just, just very quickly, uh, talking a little bit about the election calendar. So uh, people will pull papers. Some people don't know what they even know what that means. Uh, what does that mean to pull papers? Um, and so this is their the intention. You're letting the municipality know that you uh, plan to um, run for office. You get a packet um, with a bunch of information about, about how the election runs. And then you get a signature sheet. Uh, every single candidate, regardless of um, uh, seat or uh, school committee versus city council, you need 50 signatures uh, from Waltham residents. If you're a ward councilor, they have to be in your ward. If they're from uh, at large, they can be anyone in Waltham, you have to be a registered voter. And so you have uh, until June 30th um, to get 50 signatures. And so that is the that is the next thing that's going to happen. Uh, your, people are pulling papers um, and people are submitting signatures. A few candidates like Emily Spiri and Jonathan Paz have already submitted their signatures, which is like so unheard of. They did so, so fast. Um, usually you wait till like the end, you just gather as many signatures as possible, but they're, they're moving on to knocking on doors for uh, the general election. It's very, very quick. Um, Historically, people like Paul Brasco, who's no longer around, he would pull papers like a day beforehand, get 50 signatures and then, and then do it. I don't know if it was like a joke to him or something. Um, but uh, so you shouldn't think like what we just listed is, is the candidates. I'm sure every single incumbent is gonna pull papers. Um, and then I'm sure a few more people that aren't incumbents are gonna pull papers. What we just listed is definitely not the end result. And they have it until June 30th uh, to do that. And so if you're at large, um, I think I, I, I think I'm right. I might be wrong. I think the number is 13. Um, if there's 13 candidates, then there'll be a preliminary. And um, and for school committee, I think if there's more than six, there'll be a preliminary. And then in all the other races, if there's more than two, there will be a preliminary. Um, and so on September 12th, there will be a preliminary um, where that those those races narrow. Uh, and then in November, in November 2nd, um, 
November 7th, I'm sorry, uh, there will be the municipal election. Uh, there's a bunch of deadlines about like paperwork and like uh, uh, election finance stuff, but it's not really as interesting to the people listening to this. Um, but the next, the next step is June 30th. That is when that is the final. That is everyone that has pulled papers will pull papers. Everyone that has submitted their signatures will have submitted signatures. We will know who uh, is uh, on the ballot in, unless those signatures come back as um, inaccurate, which is which. I can't think of a single time that's ever happened. Um, and so that is where we're at with elections. Excited about it. Uh, please get involved. Please reach out to us if you want to know how to get involved. Um, please run for office if you're thinking about running for office. Um, we're going to move on to single family zoning, uh, which is a topic that um, is a very serious one. Uh, and um, I hope we can do this justice. Uh, but we are here to update you on single family zoning. So James, please take it away. So this has been part of a long series of meetings over the past few months, but uh, it started from a resolution from Sean Durkee, uh, which stemmed from complaints about the use of single family homes by landlords to house people beyond the zone density in the sort of more uh, suburban single family parts of Waltham. Uh, in this committee, the whole meeting, there was a discussion between the city solicitor at the committee, uh, where a number of councillors then opined on the situation, mostly discussing, um, like, with the solicitor, what precedent there was for this, which was citing Supreme Court in Massachusetts and federal for various things, which we'll get into. And assure and counselors felt the need to sort of assure the viewing public to trust them that to only enforce this in problem situations. But the sort of overall definite defining of single family was on basically what they were discussing, and that was no more than two unrelated people living together essentially. And they seem like they already have the justification to go after houses for zoning violations, like housing people beyond that. Uh, beyond like that without the need for this ordinance and that they've from this discussion they came out that they had already sent out notification to 29 households already so the uh it's still under discussion like we said earlier in the intro they have not we've not seen the text of the ordinance that they're crafting yet so thank you james so yeah they continued the discussion uh they brought in a lawyer to talk more about uh this and I mean, it's it's frightening to me. Um, it's kind of, it's crazy the the juxtaposition of like me frightened about this and many other people frightened about this. And and some city council is like excited about this. They're excited uh, that that these things that these things are happening. That we are getting closer to defining what a family is. And there's a lot of things I want to say about this. So I'm not really sure how to structure this conversation. But um, so let's let's start with let's start with the fact that the city is essentially evicting these twenty six people. Twenty six letters went out to twenty six homes, and and they said they are not in compliance with this with single family zoning. So was it twenty six or twenty nine? Twenty nine. Let's say twenty nine. Yeah. Um, and so twenty nine households are going to shrink. They they are going to be less people. And those people will have to leave. And so the city of Waltham is evicting what I assume is mostly students. They actually said that. They said mostly students. Uh, roughly, uh, roughly two thirds of which. Yeah, yeah. Are students. And so, and so the well, city of Waltham is evicting people right now. Um, they didn't show any plans uh, for like how to get them housing. No counselor brought up any concern about. Like what are, what's going to happen to these people? But those people are getting kicked out of there where they're living. And so I think I think a good uh, thing to show is this map that um, a Brandeis group uh, has uh, called Reform Brandeis Housing. I think 
And yeah, I'm actually using um, Waltham uh, Inclusive Housing, which we talked about in the headlines, but it's a new group um, looking at affordable and abundant housing in Waltham. Um, our friend Tom is involved in that. i uh, really excited about that group. And they shared this image from, um, which they acquired from um, the Brandeis Group uh, Reform, Brandeis Housing, I believe. Um, but if you can't see it, uh, this is a lot of black area where single family zoning exists. A lot of it is in the, is in the north side, but definitely some in the south side as well. Um, looks like all of Ward 4, all of Warrendale is essentially single family zoning. Um, a lot of uh, uh, the area around Brandeis on top of Brandeis, uh, which is hilarious because so many students live there. Um, and then a lot of the, just, you know, a lot of North Waltham, a lot of uh, what a, a lot of what isn't single family zoning is also green space in, in North Waltham. And so like a good majority of North Waltham also single family zoning. So all of that, uh, if you are not a nuclear family, if you are not two more, if you are more than two non-related people living together, you are illegal, but you are you're living illegally under this new ordinance that is going through the motions. Now I would like, uh, around this time, I would like to say that it's like 50-50 with the conversation with the city council right now. 50% of the time, they are saying, we want to define what a family is. And so to that is going to help us enforce this law. That is our goal. That is what we need to do. We have Karen Dunn saying, uh, you know, if two, if more than two students are living together in a single family zone and they're, you know, the best neighbors ever. Um, and George Darcy actually had the audacity uh, with, with, you know, I support him for doing this, but I didn't think anyone would, saying that, you know, stu some students uh, are better neighbors than just your average Waltham resident. Um, and so Karen Dunn was saying, if more than two students are living together and do nothing wrong, they're the best neighbors, are they allowed to be there? And the lawyer said, no. Like that's illegal under what we're talking about. And so half the time uh, they're saying, they're saying we need to figure out what, is, what a family means. So we need to define what that is. Um, and then the other half is them saying, this isn't a witch hunt. We're not going after people. We're just, we're just trying to you know, comply with what single family zoning is. It's scary when you think about you know, the queer community, the poly community. Um, even George Darcy brought up a good example of like, uh, for older and disabled people, what does it look like if a caregiver lives with you full time? And so those are all examples where under uh, this current thing, um, that we're talking about, those, those things are going to be illegal. Um, and probably one of the most disturbing things was that, um, James, you, you remember this sentence better than I do, but what, what did the- Everybody say? knows what a single family zone district looks like. We need to look at that ordinance and outline and highlight the definition of what the single family in our book reads so that there's no gray area, period. Uh, again, and I apologize if I wasn't clear, all of the cases that I have cited say, um, even without a definition, everyone knows what a single family zoning district is supposed to look, act, and live like. But it could not hurt, as I said, to address some of the attempted excuses some of these people have tried to use. And so like things like that are incredibly disturbing to me, um, especially in this climate uh, right now. You know, we can say like, oh, well, Massachusetts is so progressive. Like we're not, you know, we're safe from this kind of stuff. But who knows what's going to happen in a couple of years? Who knows what's going to happen next year? And also, who knows how strong local rights are going to be? If they're, you know, if they're stronger, uh, Waltham can just decide to do things. And also because like the home people that have li live in houses and he have like an outsized sort of voice, it's going to be slanted towards reflecting what they want. And there's probably going to be a lot of turnover in renters down the line. So who's to say what counselors elected by people living there down the line are going to view as enforceable right so like maybe we can trust the people doing the enforcement now but what's it going to look like down the line when yeah it's new people yeah like it's you can't this is just like a, not a good road to go down 
Absolutely not. Oh, I just wanted to clarify. So in case, in case people are watching this who are, you know, worried that they're in imminent danger of eviction. Well, first, we, we don't know what the letters said and we don't know who they went to. We're going to try to find out and we'll report on it if we do. So we don't know that the letter was an eviction letter. It may have been a, the first step in a process. So we don't know if anyone is in short term danger of eviction. However, Chris is right that the ultimate goal would be to get certain people out of where they are. So in the long term, people are in danger of eviction. We also mm -hmm. don't know what this ordinance is going to say. We don't understand necessarily why the ordinance is necessary, because if our existing ordinances allow them to send out these letters to 29 houses, why do we need a new ordinance? So we don't know for sure that the ordinance is going to try to define a family, but it's reasonable to think that it might, because that was the language that was in the resolution that Durkee originally said submitted and there's been a lot of talk about unrelated people so we're concerned about that we don't know for sure it's going to happen um, but both of those things are reasons that people should be paying attention to this and i think that one of the massachusetts supreme court things they cited was specifically going again going after short-term rental operators and using that type of language to just to, as like the, the way to go after that and they they've definitely been trying to frame this conversation around they want to go after problem landlords it still strikes me as a little bit of a problem that the end result is sending letters to tenants to get to to, to like you know clear the premises for building inspection when already like we'll get to this in, later on but like there's not enough information being given to tenants about what their rights are in general so and also a, and also uh the fact that, you know, 29 letters went out to non-complying or, you know, large violating uh, households. And so if the city is going to be more proactive with this, uh, if they're going to be, you know, keeping an eye on violations and complaints, why do we need an ordinance at all? Why do we need to define single family zoning for anyway? If we're already, you know, stepping up our game about these these complaints, if we're already sending out these letters, why are we trying to define what a family is? Why at this day and age are we trying to define what normal is uh, and like what is what is admissible when we're already doing the end result, which is you know evicting people? <laughs> why are we already doing that um, if we're if we're already doing that? Uh, so I don't really understand that either. One other thing that jumped out to me too, and this was uh, they mentioned that some of the information for doing like sending out these letters came from uh like the fire department going into the houses and seeing modifications yeah. that allow for more people to live in them and that does strike me as something that's a bit of a problem because like the the outcome of this could then be like people not making calls to the fire department because it could then result in them getting evicted and oh absolutely 100 percent. you know i i've um if you follow our show the first time we ever talked about this i talked about like i am one of those uh areas where like i i you know as a working class poor person i require like i can't afford you know me and one other person living in a place like that that is not that is not something that i can do i require have a lots of lots of roommates and i you know i can think of like of my my apartment on charles street um i had like six roommates you know i think under this law uh and i wonder if, if you know is the evidence in single family zoning um but it, it requires certain people to live under certain standards that are some would say subpar um and so i'm trying to think like if i'm in that situation if i'm on that apartment in charles street and like my landlord isn't doing something uh and like i want to complain about that landlord um if i know about this and i know that i'm in one of these compromised situations i can't call the city i am not going to call the city anymore. Um, i am just going to live with these subpar conditions um and you know just hope for something better in the future and so it is definitely putting people's health at risk um uh, along with just being you know dystopian this is literally dystopian well and it's the people that are like saying that they don't want to have like favelas or whatever that are basically creating a situation where it's going to start to happen like that where you're just going to have a place to get worse and worse maintained because people aren't going to be reporting stuff because, because i mean like them also going the enforcement route is has the problem of yeah it's just evicting basically the poor people in the city 
It's the going to be the functional outcome. And James talked about this uh, right before we got on the air, but it ties back to the MBTA's Communities Act as well. The MBTA's Communities Act is like, Waltham sucks for housing. There's not enough housing in Waltham based on the population. Uh, you guys are now forced to rezone to uh, make more housing. And Waltham's like, what the fuck? We're not going to do that. That's stupid. You had but city also, councilors talking about, like, could we shut down an MBTA station? Would that yeah. reduce the number of people we'd have to build housing for? Like, it's and like, so that's we, the level that they're operating on. The state, remember, yeah. Uh, we, Councillor Durkee asked if the, the Waltham could divorce the state of Massachusetts. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I think this is, I think that's really alarming what they said about the fire department. Um, I think it, that's really unacceptable on a humanitarian level to deter people from calling 911 in an emergency. It's also bad for the whole community because obviously if there's a fire and you don't call 911, it's going to spread, right? And, you know, we, this is something as a homeowner who's ever been a renter might not understand why that is. They might not understand that, you know, renters are in these situations, not because they thought it would be fun to have all their, you know, 20 of their buddies live in a house, but because that was the only place they could find to live. And there are a lot of people who don't tell their landlord when there's a maintenance problem because the landlord will add that on to the rent. And so the idea that there could be a rumor that goes around that says, you know, don't call the fire department if there's a fire because you're going to get reported. That's a real and, thing that could really happen. And not, and, and not, and it's not even just the fire department either. It's the, you know, black mold is a thing and if the landlord does nothing about it the course of action is you know call a public health department i'm not calling the fucking health department anymore no way so they can have come someone come in and see that there's six people when there should be three and and then we all get evicted because of this weird ordinance no way and i i think that's a, it's a you know the main point from all of this because because the two p the two things about defining a family we don't know if they're going to go with that we don't know the details of these letters but for anyone who's new who's starting and i think there are some folks at brandeis who are starting to pay attention to waltham politics because of this the main thing to understand is that this discussion is happening exclusively from the point of view of homeowners this entire discussion about student housing it was has not been about how to help students in any way it's only about addressing the needs of homeowners and it's being done with no acknowledgement that Waltham has a housing crisis and Brandeis has a housing crisis they're only focusing on this one issue of the inconvenience that the student houses are causing the homeowners they had representatives from Brandeis and Bentley in during one of these conversations but it didn't focus on why don't you provide enough housing for your students it only focused on how can we work together that when we're you know a student's doing something wrong we can work together to punish them that was more the point in the conversation and, and so regardless of tried to introduce the thing an amendment to bring in representatives from brandeis into that whole conversation and that was shut down and yeah they, they whole... said they said we're done with that we're done we're just gonna we're gonna do it on our own so yeah so there's a movement at brandeis among students to try to pressure the university to actually provide enough housing for the people it admits and there's no indication that anyone at the city wants to help with that they're not concerned about the housing supply and this is what people need to know if you're going to vote or you're thinking about running in this election our current government does not want to increase the housing supply they want to solve what's inconvenient for homeowners and that's it mm -hmm. 100%, 100%. And yeah, we brought it, I brought it up before, uh, and I'll say it again, that everyone agrees that Brandeis students shouldn't exist in uh, Waltham neighborhoods. Brandeis should build more housing. Uh, and But there are just like, it's interesting to see how people like uh, come up with an answer to that, to that problem. Uh, some people are like, okay, well, let's, let's, talk to Brandeis, uh, let's organize around that issue and get them to build more housing. And some people are like, let's make it illegal for students to live in our neighborhoods. And like, oh, that's absolutely. just an interesting way to do that. That's an interesting response. This says a lot about you, that that's what you decided to do. It, it's the whole taking the enforcement approach first that really sort of shows. And like, because there is a solution to this. It just requires doing what they don't want to do, which is increasing the density <laughs> around the Brandeis T station. Yeah. yeah, like going back to the MBTAs. Yeah, like there, someone, the, the state said, this is this is how you solve this. And the city said no. And on top of that, we're going to make even less housing. Yeah, we're going to start evicting people. Yeah, with no plans for them. Gross. So yeah, that conversation is going to continue. Um, and we are going to keep an eye on it uh, because it's uh, 
probably the most dystopian thing that's happening right now. Uh, but there's some other dystopian stuff happening, which we're going to get to right now. Um, and so the tenants rights ordinance um, that we've been talking about um, came to another head today uh, and Josh will uh, introduce this topic. Yeah, I'm gonna to try to say what happened in a neutral way. It's hard because it was a very contentious meeting and depending on your point of view, you might've seen different things going on. But what happened was uh, a while back, Councillor Paz introduced a resolution that was very broad, talking about helping landlords um, and tenants and, and homeowners. Um, and that went to the Community and Economic Development Committee um, they had discussions about it, and they had discussions of this idea that Watch CDC brought in, which is an ordinance, a notification ordinance, which would require if you're in danger of being evicted, your landlord has to give you a piece of paper that tells you your rights and resources available to help you. That's it. It doesn't change the rules for landlords. It shouldn't have any negative impact on them unless they are taking advantage of their tenants not knowing what the rules are. So has thought that what he was doing was going through a process to get this ordinance passed. So it went to the ordinances and rules committee and they didn't do anything with it. So housing advocates started coming into every meeting. So they came into the ordinances and rules committee and Councillor Harris said, I think that you should have a hearing on this. Um, and the way to do that is first to send it back to the full council and then you can schedule the hearing. So he, they sent it back to the full council at the last meeting, Paz brought it up. Councillor LaFauci blocked it from being discussed. At this meeting, he brought it up again. He made a motion to have a public input session. Councillor Harris then said, this is not the right way to go about it. He's being disrespectful of the rules of the council. And there was a discussion about an hour long um, where it was Councillor Harris and Councillor McMenamin both kind of driving home the point to pass that he was going about this the wrong way. So Councillor Harris made a motion. He said, she said that this is out of order because you're, you want to have a public hearing, but really what you need is a citizen hearing. And those are two totally different things. So Pat said, okay, well, we'll change the language, that's fine. But they still talked about it for like half an hour, like they were expecting him to argue with it. About, so they still talked for like half an hour about how important this change in wording was. They're two totally different things. So he said, okay, to that. So then Councillor Harris wanted to add another um, amendment where she said, well, you brought in a resolution that was just broadly about housing. So you can only do a public hearing, that's a citizen hearing that's broadly about housing. So she wanted to change it. So instead of being a hearing about the ordinance, it's just a hearing about everything. And so she put a motion on there and Pat said, well, you know, I'm not okay with that because we want to talk about an ordinance. And if this isn't the way to do it, I'll do it. I want to do it the right way, but we don't want to go back to the beginning and have a general conversation about housing. Um, so he moved instead of, he moved to file it without prejudice. So that would allow him to come back and resubmit an ordinance. And then they would go through the ordinance process. He, when he said he, when he moved to file it without prejudice, um, Councillor McMenamin asked the council to vote on a motion to file it. She interrupted him before he said without prejudice, and then the council ended up voting on the motion that wasn't what he said, even though he tried twice to, to correct her, she kept telling him to be quiet. Um, I would uh, move to file the matter, and I'm happy to reintroduce just the ordinance language so we can actually focus on that subject matter. I, I, I'd rather not... Uh, I'd rather not have a, what I would consider respectfully, a symbolic thing that doesn't actually achieve anything legislatively. Thank you, Councilor. So you made a motion. Please sit. And the motion to file is not debatable. Prejudice. Excuse me. The motion to file is not Madam, debatable. Madam President, I the motion to file is not debatable. You made a motion. Without, Please without sit. prejudice. Please sit. Can we make sure that it's Please the right sit. motion? I, I, I'm just trying to finish what I'm saying. Is that okay? Please sit. It's not okay. Please sit. So the... Motion has been made to file. It's not debatable. The clerk will call Point the roll. Order, Madam President. Please sit down, Council. We're in, I'm in the middle of a roll prejudice. call. I'm in the middle of a roll call, I said Councilor. file without prejudice, Madam Please President. Please sit, Councilor. So they voted on that motion that nobody made that failed. 
counselor that has then put in another motion to file it without prejudice, which succeeded. So it got filed. So basically nothing happened in this meeting. The advocates didn't get to speak. No hearing was scheduled. There was an hour conversation about the rules. And it seems like it was a good outcome in the sense that now Paz gets to refile this as an, as a, as an ordinance and have the conversation he wants to have. But it was really a frustrating outcome for the people who are watching. Um, and it was, it was a disgraceful conversation. Um, I think if peep, anyone who turned on the video, you know, started, if this was your first city council meeting that you watch, you probably wouldn't watch another one. So councilor, wait just a minute now. What then happened? Sit down, please, council. Council, rise. What happened yeah, so, after that? Uh, no, explain to me exactly how we got here. What happened after it reached the council floor without committee reference? It's before us now. What happened uh, with you the, then? The Ward 1 counselor invoked section um, no? 2.9 to delay, to you know, not act on the matter on the first time around. Is that what we're talking about? or? Uh, you tell me. All right, so I'll tell you're you running what this, I, You're running what this I, resolution. You yeah, tell yeah, me. Yeah, so we, we started uh, with a conversation in economic and community development, and we felt the need that this could lead no, into... No, no, no. We May just went through that. Yeah, we just yeah. went through that. You tell me what happened when the resolution came out of the Rules and Ordinances Committee to the full council a month ago have, without committee reference. Madam President, respectfully, I have to clarify the record here. When it came out of economic and community development, we submitted an ordinance because that's where the Rules and Ordinances Excuse Committee Excuse me, handles. I will tell you what happened to that. It was filed on December 27th, 2022. The ordinance. It was. The ordinance is It the was. Matter. No, ordinance, no, I, excuse me. I no. don't see that in my records. You had a resolution that came in in 2020. 2020. That does not uh, you have. Madam President, I. Excuse me. Just a minute, please. You had a resolution submitted to this city council in the year 2020. It was in 2020. It, that was a. Please sit for a minute, council. I call a one minute recess. It was so frustrating to see so much arguing about rules when and no debate about the actual issue at hand, which is should tenants be notified of their rights. Um, I may have more to say on it, but I'll give it back to you first, Chris or James, if you have more to say. I think the thing to highlight, too, is that uh, there's plenty of precedent for like resolutions to get turned into ordinances, it seems like, like especially between like especially because we were just talking about the the resolution from Councillor Durkee for the single family homes, right? So we might as well talk about it in the context of this. So like they're crafting an or ordinance based on that resolution and are perfectly able to call people to talk about it in both committees. I mean, they haven't called on like the homeowners, but they've talked about it at length. And within the rules, there's plenty of, there, there, there's plenty of examples of them suspending the rules to do something but there generally has to be support from the committee to do it. So the reason that this went through all of this sort of rigmarole was because there wasn't support in ordinance and rules to talk about it. It got sent back with sort of the promise that, oh, this will then allow it to get talked about. And then it suddenly the goalposts shift to, oh, but you can only talk about it in this specific context that we are describing. You're not allowed to talk about it anywhere else. So it strikes me that this is like a very sort of intentional obfuscation of like the whole process like you can talk about things without having to go through the entire rules but then we spend an, like hour talking about how important the rules are if it's something that they don't want to talk about so yeah james uh, brings up a good point that like and talked a little bit about during the meeting but like this ordinance does not require a citizen input hearing all ordinance changes require public hearing eventually when that is all, when the whole ordinance is all said and done and you're ready to just say, this is it, take it or leave it. Um, you know, just, just you know, maybe make a little changes in ordinance and rules eventually, but um, that then it is a public hearing and a public hearing and a citizen input hearing are two different things. I don't know if uh, anyone listening here wants me, me to tell you the difference, but uh, public hearing is very official and, uh, and counselors can go back and forth a little bit. Um, 
And so a citizen is not required. This was Kathy Ann Harris sitting on this uh, resolution for months and months and months. And then, and then eventually when people started showing up, she was like, we need to hear from some people. And so even if Jonathan Paz had done this uh, citizen input hearing with whatever the council decided and at whatever time that he needed to do, whatever hoops that he needed to jump through, um, it, it doesn't really matter because you would still have to do the public hearing eventually anyway. And also, did this citizen input hearing need to be done um, at all? You know, we've been hearing from that from from watching tenants that this needs to be done anyway. It's like, what what else do we need to talk about? Let's 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 do the thing. Um, and then also, it 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 brings up the question and of, of Kathy Ann Harris and ordinance and rules. Um, again, this this uh, meeting, she doubled down on the on the premise um, that people can't talk during ordinance and rules. And so it it uh, is pretty much the cusp of her argument, too. It's why they were in uh, the, the city council in the first place, why they weren't doing it in ordinance and rules. I mean, why the whole rigmarole was happening um, was that Watch wanted to talk about this in ordinance and rules, and Kathy and Harris said, "There's no fucking way this is happening," uh, because two reasons: one, um, there is no support on it from committee, and I think we showed that clip uh, already. Uh, she said, "There is no support on the committee to hear from to hear from um, Watch right now," uh, and two, uh, she said it at the last meeting and in this meeting uh, that like ordinance and rules is some kind of like special committee for like special people, uh, like a quasi, I forget the word she used, quasi, like like lawmaking committee. And because of that, um, that not just anyone can speak, but those are two different reasons. And so like, those are two different, is it because uh, there was no support on it from the committee or is it because it's physically not possible uh, for someone that's not a lawyer to not do, to be uh, speaking on the resolution? But, is it impossible yeah. to suspend the rules in this committee for some reason? Yeah, yeah, because actually no one is allowed to speak uh, that's not on the committee is allowed to speak, but and plenty of people do. It just requires a quick suspension of the rules. It happens every single committee. Um, and so and so I think and also what's 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 so funny about all this is that um, we talked about this before, is that is that they weren't looking for a citizen input hearing in ordinance and rules. They were looking for the representative of Watch, who is the maker of the resolution or the author of the resolution, to talk about it. That's incredibly relevant. And that is what ordinance and rules is about. This is about the relevant people talking about the thing. And so they weren't looking for just a, you know, a circus of people to talk. They were looking for a representative of Watch to talk. And so, and so it ends up being sent to the city council and all of this is going on and it's all for no reason because they're going to have to do a public hearing anyway. And it's, so it's, it's Kathy Ann diverting the entire conversation to like a parliamentary cul-de-sac where yeah. nothing can possibly happen is what yeah. it was. And also if, and, and if it had gone her way, if they had done the public hearing, it would have been a huge victory for her because she was the whole reason it was, it was happening anyway. To file something means that you cannot talk about something. It, it means it, it disappears from the docket and you're not allowed to talk about it for a year. Year. Usually, this is actually like like a dick move that you want to do to something that you don't support, and so no one can talk about it for a year. Like this is usually reserved for like things you don't support. But if you're uh, if you're a maker of a resolution and you realize that your thing isn't going to pass because of X, Y, or Z, or, you know, good or bad, whatever it is, uh, then what you usually want to do is you want to file it without prejudice. And, and so what that means is that anyone can can submit something that has to do with that and there's no yearly suspension on it or whatever. And so you can just call, you can just come right back with it, um, it after you do X, Y, and Z, whatever you think is gonna help you pass whatever it is it's gonna do. And so, and so Jonathan Paz says, you know, if this is what is gonna happen, then I would rather just file it. And then Kath Kathleen says, well, you said file, we're gonna file. And so Kathleen was, was trying to, to to hurt Jonathan Paz, she, she was trying to hurt Watch. She was trying to hurt the tenants' rights ordinance because she knows that's not what he meant. She knows that's not uh, that was not his intention. That that's insane to consider that that is his intention, and it's also not what he said. And also didn't even let him finish. 
And so that is just a disgusting parliamentary move. And it's also not even right. It's not, it's not what he said. And so for her to, to go out of her way to try and screw pause is, is just really gross there. We should drop in the clip of Kathy Ann Harris asking for the point of personal privilege to say that it's not personal right here. And the recommendation we got from the Ward 8 counselor was have a public, excuse me, citizen input hearing. Because apparently that is following the rules, right? Point of right? personal so, privilege. Point of I'm, personal I'm privilege. Me. I'm finishing. You rise to point of personal privilege, Counselor. Please sit. Point of personal privilege. This is not personal. Don't make it personal. What this is, is Rule 88. You were handed a rules book day one on the job, and those are the rules of this game, this job, this committee. Madam President, I am. I have the excuse floor. Excuse me. She has the floor, Council. Please I have sit the floor. Till she fit. I don't need to please sit. I, please. I, excuse me, Council. Please sit. I, I only restate it because we need to get back to that business. We conduct ourselves through through the rules. I have Counselor, a motion. You can't debate the matter. You point a point of personal privilege. What is it? My point of personal privilege is that this should not be personal. What this needs to be, I have a Thank request you. That's before. That's your point. Your, your point. Thank you. You may, you may sit. Counsel, you may sit. Yeah, to expand on, on sort of what Chris was already saying, first of all, about Counselor Harris, it's hard to say, well, you know, there's a lot of technical issues involved with did Paz do this the right way or not, and who told them to do what, okay? But the underlying reality is if Councillor Harris and Councillor McMenamin wanted this ordinance to get passed, it would be moving forward. They don't want it to pass, and they haven't had to say why, because all the debate has been about the rules. Are they landlords? Are they friends or family members of landlords? Is that why they don't? Why is it unacceptable to them to put this simple rule on landlords to inform people of rights they already have? So it was very disingenuous. She came across as very disingenuous because she kept saying nobody's against anything. Like she's all these people who came in to talk about this, she's asking them to believe that she has no opinion on it. She's just trying to enforce the rules. And there was even one point where she looked them in the eye and tried to convince them she was on their side, but Paz was messing it up by breaking the rules. And this is similar to how she handled when people came in for the farm. She looked them in the eye and tried to convince them she was on their side when she was about to vote for the things they didn't want her to vote for. So that was really embarrassing to watch. But I think what Councillor McMenamin did is actually worse because first of all, there was a moment where Paz said, well, since we changed the language of the resolution, and McMenamin said, oh, from a language other than English? Councilor Paz, you have the floor. I presented this matter in different language. And the rules and ordinances- Other than English? With different language, different ordinance language. I'm not sure if this is a debate. I'm trying to share I'm not my debating position. you, Council. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to, to actually get, express. I am an, trying to Madam get President, to where we need Madam to President, be. I am trying to finish a thought, and you keep interrupting me, and that's not conducive to this. the floor, Councilor. And that comment made no sense in context. They had talked over and over about the language of the resolution, so she knew what he meant, and there's no reason for her to say that except to draw attention to his ethnicity. And I think that was unacceptable. It was subtle, it was quick, but I watched the video multiple times to try to be like, is there any other possible reason she would have said that? And there's just not. She was making a reference to his ethnicity, and I think it was to try to put, put, um, get him upset and have him make him have an emotional reaction um, so then he would look bad and he would look like he wasn't getting his way because he didn't know the rules and he was melting down over it, which wasn't what was happening. Um, and part of the reason I think that is because during the meeting, um, Councillor Durkee's sister, uh, Kelly Durkee Irwin, um, who was also, I think, on the board of the Housing Authority, posted on Facebook saying that Paz should be removed from the room. He was being so disrespectful to the decorum that he should be removed. Um, and because, and said that, well, they've told him what he needs to do to get to yes, but he still wants his own way and he keeps throwing tantrums. 
And I don't think anybody who watched this video thought Paz was throwing a tantrum. He did keep his cool the entire time. He got a little bit more argumentative as it went on, but it was pretty understandable based on the way they were talking to him was far more uncivil. And so I think that Councillor McMenamin should apologize for that. Um, and I think other oh, yeah. councils public public apology definitely apologize. The other thing she needs to apologize to the council for asking them to vote on a motion nobody made. I mean that was blatant. It was dishonest, and it really undermines. You know, uh, Councillor McMenamin has this reputation, like you know, she can be a little you know prickly sometimes, but she's a stickler for the rules. She all knows all the rules, and she cares about the rules, and that's. You know, the council needs someone like that. Well, in my mind, she just totally undermined that. She blatantly, you know, violated the rules by asking them to vote on a motion that wasn't made. Um, and I think she should apologize to the whole council for that. And they should ask her to apologize for that. And I think people need, you know, in the past, I've often thought that she used her, her, you know, she would say to people, you're breaking the rules when in fact she disagreed with them. And it's often hard to know for sure because the rules really are complicated and she has been doing it for a long time. And sometimes it's hard to say, but in this case, it's on video. She, that's a really significant breach of decorum because it could have, if they had voted yes, it would have been passed. It would have been in the minutes that that was he moved and they voted yes. And, and that's not what happened. So it, it really could have had a real impact. Um, so I, I think that people need to start questioning her reputation as the expert on the rules and start looking at the way that she and some other counselors claim to be following the rules when they're really pushing an agenda. Because what it comes down to is even if Paz made a ton of mistakes, even if they were right about everything they said about him, it's not about him. You know, since this thing has been sitting um, being discussed for months, people have been evicted and probably some of them didn't know their rights and maybe ended up homeless when they didn't need to. That's what this is about. And for them to say, well, we want to help those people, but we can't because Paz keeps screwing it up. It's just nonsense. And I think that because of Kelly's post, which seemed to be writing about what she thought was going to happen and not what actually happened. Also, what was very unusual is Mayor McCarthy was sitting in the audience. She never, almost never does that. She's usually in the building for the meeting, um, unless she's called into the meeting to, for a specific reason. She was in the audience. So I, it seemed to me like this was a performance that was designed to make Paz lose his cool so that he could be portrayed as a young immature counselor who doesn't know the rules, doesn't know how to get things done, can't get anything done because he can't get along with people and has a meltdown when you question him. And that's not what happened. But I think that's, I, I'm not trying to start a conspiracy theory, but it really seemed like this was a performance. They were using this issue to try to make Paz look bad because he's running against the mayor. And it's a really disgraceful. It's really disgraceful. And I think the rest of the council should, even the ones who don't like Paz, um, should be asking questions about how this went down. It doesn't make them look particularly good either. And I mean, like, that does tend to be how this type of, from observing how this type of thing works, like, the, they, it seems like a lot of the conversations happened before the meeting, and then you're either sort of with them or against them. And I think that they were definitely like hoping to sort of plow through this with everyone sort of in lockstep behind them for this sort of, because again, like they could have directed this in a way that it would have been productive. They just did not have that as an outcome that they wanted to see. So the conversation ended up getting structured to try to divert it into the least productive thing possible. So like, I'm glad that, like has stood his ground on this and if it means making people that are actively against tenants rights angry at him that's a good thing as far as i'm concerned so like it's really interesting when you see commentary of people who are like oh the worst thing that paz can do is make his his co-workers mad at him if his co-workers are opposed to just letting people know what their rights are as tenants that's someone who you should have mad at you Oh yeah, yeah. We haven't really talked about it. this. is such a small, small ask. And Paz actually says like this is like the floor of like our responsibilities. Like this is just this is just telling people their rights, just letting them know. Uh, we we can't even takes years, literal years, to make it happen. I mean, it's it's also election year, and like I said, it's like I think 
I wouldn't say it's the best outcome for what happened, but like there's a clear path forward. Uh, Watch already has the ordinance written. Pause can just reintroduce it. It will have the public hearing. And it's also during election. It'll be a big, big thing that's happening. People will come out. Uh, it'll be a big uh, community event. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to covering that. Um, and so there's a clear path forward for this. Um, and I do think it will happen, uh, but uh, just getting there. I mean, this is just bare minimum stuff. And Waltham just continues to just show their cards about who they're actually legislating for, which is, like I said last week, it's the 100 families legislating for the 500 families that are born here and raised here. And also just to bring it back, like this isn't personal again. This is like such a comically small ask that it absolutely seems like it's personal. Absolutely. Like, relatively speaking, like, this is just letting people know what the rules already are. And these people are, act like they care so much about the rules. And the other thing is just even if you knew nothing about our city council, if you watch this meeting, what you see is exactly what Robert Rules is designed to prevent. The meeting's not, there were, Paz was interrupted at least 10 times, I think. He was told to sit down five or six times. Nobody knew what was going on. That's exactly what the rules are designed to prevent. So if that's what you're coming up with, if that's what your meetings look like, you can't claim that you're all about enforcing the rules. Like, that's silly. I don't think that, that Robert, you know, when he wrote his rules, he was considering <laughs> a bunch of people interrupting each other, telling each other to sit down, telling each other conflicting information about what needed to happen to move it forward. It was a performance that was designed to uh, embarrass someone and it had nothing to do with enforcing rules. Yeah, I read um, Kelly Durkee's comments before I actually watched the meeting. And, you know, like, pause, you know, he's been theatrical in the past. So I was, you know, I was prepared to watch the meeting that Kelly Durkee Irwin was was illustrating. But when I watched it, you know, I tried to be very honest with uh, with everyone about everything. And just that was not the meeting I watched. Like Kathleen McMahon Redman interrupted pause multiple, multiple, multiple times. And that's just like inappropriate for the city council president to do in a, in a, in a uh the leader of a committee it's just it's just very unprofessional and that's really like i did not think pause was being super argumentative did he like talk over kathy ann i think like once uh when she talked over him like a million times and so yeah that was i, I don't know we just live in two different realities i guess because that is not the, the not the meeting i watched um Okay, yeah, so um, I just we just mentioned it, but that has been filed without prejudice. So at any point, pause can bring that up with the, with the help of watch who's already written the ordinance, I believe. Um, and so we will see that again. Um, now it depends on strategic timing, which I'm sure that camp will to discuss among themselves to figure out, uh, but it will not be talked about at the city council till it's reintroduced. And if it is reintroduced, the first thing that's going to happen is the public hearing. So you're going to hear about it before it's even talked about. So we will stay tuned on that. Um, and lastly, uh, the um, Josh has a quick update on the Municipal Housing Trust Fund. Yeah, so we talked last time about Municipal Housing Trust Fund. This is a fund that a develop, there's a law that says developers need to make a certain percentage of their units affordable um, when they're building multifamily units, or they can pay out of it by paying into this fund. So we were curious, does that fund get used to build affordable housing? So I have requested records from the clerk for Zard's office, which I got, thank you to him. And they show what we expected, that in the path that the last major expenditures from that fund on creating new housing were the bank school and the Hardy school. Um, the bank school was 24 units. I wasn't able to find out what the Hardy school was, but those were both um, completed about 10 years ago. So in the, in the past 10 years, the only money from that fund that's been used to create new housing is for the cottages at the Fernald, and that was about 70,000, which I assume other money came from somewhere else. Um, so it was what we were concerned about that people are paying into it as an offset, but it's not being used as an offset to increase the housing supply. What it was being used for was good things. It was being used for repairs. Um, it was being used for emergency rental assistance for people uh, during the pandemic who were in danger of being evicted. So that's a good thing. I'm not uh, complaining that they used it that way, except it's important to understand that they set up a law which seems like it's designed 
to increase the supply of affordable housing. And then they gave people a way out where they basically create a slush fund that doesn't have to be used that way. Um, and I think that in distinction is important because as we get into the election, a lot of people are concerned about affordable housing, but people have different ideas of what that means. A lot of people who in the city um, think that affordable housing means government owned housing or government built housing that is price capped for poor people. That's one type. But we are in a housing crisis where even middle income and even some high income people can't afford to live in Waltham. And so when advocates, when activists are talking about affordable housing, what they're talking about is building new housing and to address that problem. And when you know the subject comes up, the mayor has a long list of examples she can give of how she's pro-housing, pro-affordable housing, how she's helped create affordable housing, and you shouldn't say she's against it. Same with Councillor McMenamin. She likes to list off what she's done. But what's important to understand is they're talking about things where they built a small number of units and, what, and that's great for those families who moved into those units. It's a good thing, but it does not bring down rents. It does not address the underlying problem. So the MBTA Communities Act is designed to address the underlying problem by greatly increasing the supply so that hopefully if uh, free market people are correct, that will cause the rents to go down for everyone. What the mayor's sort of talking point about MBT Communities Act has been is, they want, they're trying to force us to build luxury housing, and I want to build real affordable housing, and I know how to do that, so they shouldn't be interfering. And the flaw in that argument is there, she's talking about two different goals. The state is trying to increase the supply to fix the problem. She is, sees affordable housing as kind of a charity. You do something nice for some families, but the goal is never to reduce rents. The goal is not, and that's the truth of you know, if somebody says she has a poor record on housing and she says, oh no, look at these 10 things I've done. Well, she does have a poor, very poor record on housing in the sense that Waltham has created very little new housing in the past 20 years. At the same time, we've created a ton of new commercial um, properties and that's why we have traffic issues. But when someone tries to build housing, the biggest objection is always traffic. So we have to get past that. And, and so in this election, when you're talking to your candidates about housing, they're all gonna say they're in favor of affordable housing. But you gotta ask them things like, are you in favor of significantly increasing the housing supply in Waltham? And the reality is most of the incumbents are not. They see a big part of their job as preventing the housing supply from increasing. So that's an important thing to think is, is there's this difference between helping out some people and fixing the problem. And the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is a good example of money that has been used for good things that people can talk about in good ways, but it's not being used to fix the problem it was designed to solve. Also, I will say that luxury housing means market rate housing it really doesn't have any up in, any, any other real meaning aside from that it's just yeah what she's saying is that if we have to build market rate housing so in the short term developers are probably going to build luxury condos no one can afford but in the long term if the law works it will bring down rents for everyone and so that's a different thing than what she's been doing building a few units here a few units there I'm still skeptical because I don't think developer landlords are going to build themselves out of profits. I think they're going to want to keep rents as high as they possibly can. But that's that's their that's their premise, I guess. And Josh brings up a good point that um, you know, when the MBTA community act brought up, they were like, Oh, well, I'm full in support of affordable housing, but this is not that. It's just like, bro, where's your affordable housing? You've been on yeah, the yeah, where's, where's You've your been work? Yeah. double dozens of years. Where is it, bro? A good, a good question to ask candidates and for Brandeis students to ask administrators is what are you doing about our housing crisis and find out are they even willing to acknowledge that there is a crisis, mm -hmm. you know, because we don't hear that in the city council we hear a crisis of homeowners being annoyed by college students, but we never hear about the reason college students are living in those places because there's no place else to go. Um, and that's that's what we got to change the conversation. And, and okay. this money is something where the city could be doing something concrete, like building housing. Yeah. And, and not just paying it out to landlords. 
Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Housing rental assistance is great because it keeps someone from getting evicted. It keeps a family in their home, but a hundred percent of the money goes to the landlord. So it's, it's like a, a middle. So it's like a, a thing that's good for people in the short term, but it's not addressing the real problem. Okay. I think that will do it. A lot of big topics here. Um, a quick plug. If, uh, you know, if you like our show, if you would like to see our show succeed, please uh, consider reaching out to help us make this show. Um, we're not talking about just chatting uh, on this on air like this. If you know, you know, if you're one of those people that like to talk about Waltham, we'd love to chat about that. But also, it requires a lot of, uh, you know, behind the scenes stuff. It requires a lot of chatting, it leads on stories, just takes on stories. What we should we be talking about? Editing all of this stuff requires effort. Just posting all this stuff requires effort. And so really just like any skill set, all you need is this, is a desire to want to help and we can find something. Uh, attending and watching meetings. Yeah, attending and watching meetings, letting us know what's going on. Uh, being a liaison for that is also really important. But yeah, definitely uh, looking to expand. There's so many more cool things we could be doing with this show, uh, but it just requires more than the capacity that we have right now. Um, so thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, thank you, Josh and James, for, for coming on and chatting with us as well. And we will see you next week. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.